it was just a joke. And did you confess to Mr. Norman? We did. Did you? What he did he say? He gave us a second job, but Norman found it very, very easy. <laughs> Rich, Richard Kerr just couldn't cope with it. All right. <laughs> well, good morning to you. Good morning. And we are in the book of Ephesians, and we're coming, turning to chapter 4 of Ephesians this morning, which is a, a kind of a hinge in the book, is a change. It's uh, getting to more practical exhortations. Let's review the book of Ephesians so far and see where we are in the big picture. The book of Ephesians really has a big time frame. You can sense the Apostle is conscious of eternity past and eternity future. He can see that God had a plan, a great plan in creating human beings. And that plan was uh, kind of blown off course by sin, and he talks about sin in chapter 2 and various things. But God never wavered. The plan was blown off for a, for a while, blown off course for a while, but God just kept on moving in the same direction. And when we come to the Gospel, we're actually coming to the fulfilment of God's eternal plan for humanity. And so he, his plan is to bring everything into Christ, everything into Jesus, which is, is a wonderful plan because in Jesus there is peace, there is love, there are resources for life that are so wonderful and big and powerful. And so that plan is continuing. And he full, he's brought the plan back on track by giving Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. And we compared him to an elevator, a lift, by which when we embrace Christ, we are taken out of the lowest place and taken in a moment of time into the highest place, which is in heavenly places in Christ. We are planned into him and in him we are already in part, in spirit, in heavenly places, in him. And so that plan is being brought back in through the gospel, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He also says that God's plan for the Jews was, uh, this was his plan for them, but he also has included the Gentiles in that plan. So that all the prophe prophecies and promises to the Jews uh, are now being fulfilled in whoever will believe in Jesus as the Messiah. And he's made of Jew and Gentile one. He's created this new man, this body which is the church. And this church is going to reveal his plan throughout, both in time and throughout all eternity. There's going to be such a wisdom and a greatness revealed in his people, the church. He has two prayers, one in chapter 1, one in chapter 3. And his prayers are that we would have the spirit of revelation to understand these things. And then in chapter uh, 3, the prayer is that we would be strengthened in might, with might by the inner man, that Christ may dwell in us and that we would be rooted and grounded in the love of God, filled with the love of God, filled with the fullness of God. And uh, he concludes this chapter 3, this section, this first section, by saying, God is able to do abundantly above all that we ask or think. And that's the end of chapter 3. Then in chapter 4, he turns to exhortations. He's going to exhort us to walk in accordance with this great plan. So his first exhortation is to walk in unity. Then he's going to uh, exhort us to walk in purity. He exhorts us to walk in love in chapter 5. He exhorts us to walk in wisdom. And he exhorts us, if we're married, to live 
in accordance with this uh, great wisdom of God that we should love one another in marriage and also therefore be a manifestation of the glory of God in marriage and in our homes and in our workplaces. Some of the exhortations are incredibly practical. I don't know if we'll get to some of those this morning, but some of the exhortations are incredibly basic. You can almost think, is he talking to a church? And the answer is, yes, he is. One of the incredibly basic um, uh, uh, exhortations is, stop stealing. <laughs> don't steal anymore. And you think, well, isn't that obvious? But he gives that exhortation. He says, I don't want you to steal anymore. Now, in a, I'm pretty sure in this congregation this morning, this exalted congregation, there's nobody stealing. I've put my pen and locked my bag. And uh, <laughs> No, we would think nobody's going to steal here. And if I said to you, you know, there's no stealing here this morning, you would think, well, that's very basic. But if you think of a larger congregation, a growing church, and people coming into the church, People who don't know these things, don't know, are just new, newcomers, new converts. And uh, sadly, we haven't got thousands of new converts <laughs> here listening to me this morning. But in those days, there, would, there, there was such a move of the Holy Spirit, and there were people coming in at all different levels. And so he has to say, you're stealing? You've got to stop that. Anyway, we'll come to that. Uh, in chapter uh, 4, I think it is, we'll come to that as well. His conclusion in chapter 6 is that if we will uh, grasp this great vision that is outlined in chapter 3, and if we will grasp the greatness of what it is to be in the love of God and rooted and grounded in all these things that are there in chapter 1 to 3, and in the power of Christ, if we will grasp these things, we will be capable to develop a walk, an actual conduct, uh, which is so powerful. And the conclusion will be, we will be a powerful people in prayer as well. And the final exhortation is to pray. So let's go to chapter 4. So we've got the first three chapters, if you like, describing who we are in Christ now that we have been changed by the power of the cross and now we are rooted in his love that's the exhort that's the the description of our position our life in Christ and then chapter 4 he's going to begin an exhortation let's read verse 1 i therefore the prisoner of the lord I'm in prison because of the Lord. Beseech you to walk worthy of the calling to which you are called with all lowliness, gentleness, long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one church, if you like, in Epsom, only one church in Epsom, only one church in the United Kingdom, only one church worldwide, one body. And uh, one spirit, not two different spirits at work. One Holy Spirit. Just as you were called in one hope of your calling, you have a glorious future in one heaven. There's not two heavens. We have a hope. One Lord, one Saviour. One faith, one baptism. Now when you read that you think, well, he obviously hadn't heard of infant baptism because in the beginning when they were baptized by immersion then later you get 
another baptism, but he's not referring to water baptism, he's referring to the baptism into the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And there's the first the first section of chapter 4 is an exhortation to unity. Let's just go through a number of things here in further detail. Let's just notice that phrase, I the prisoner of the Lord. When Paul was writing this, we assume, we think, he had different imprisonments and people do debate which prison he was in at this point and he, there may have been prisons. Uh, imprisonments that are not recorded because that seems to be implied in various places. So he was probably imprisoned three or four times in his life. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. And uh, if I were, I remember when Terry Waite was in prison he was in uh, Lebanon and I remember the Anglican church put this uh, billboard up. Uh, Terry Waite isn't in church this morning this Sunday morning. What's your excuse? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I thought that was a very... I'm not sure it was the best, uh, the best uh, way of getting people to go to church, but it was a very interesting thought. Uh, Terry Waite's not in church this Sunday morning. He's in prison in Lebanon because he was there on the mission for the Lord and he was caught by terrorists and imprisoned and so on. And so what's your excuse? Why aren't you there? Uh, well, you're maybe on the golf course, or you may be shopping, or you may be in the gym, or whatever. What's your excuse? I suppose that's what's their, their implication. Now, I'm assuming that none of us here will have been in prison for the, for the Lord. We've never been in prison for our faith. And I'm guessing we won't be. I'm not expecting to be imprisoned for my faith. Uh, there are countries I go to, I mean, I've just been to Cameroon and there are some kidnappings there. So you, are, you do wonder a little bit, it's possible. But uh, I didn't really fear that. But I have been in difficult circumstances and I'm not referring to exotic difficult circumstances. I've been in riots and I've been in countries where there was a coup d'etat and there was civil war breaking out. I've been in difficult situations, but I'm not referring to that. I'm referring to the problems that you have with life. And you sometimes think, oh, I wish I could get out of this. You feel a prisoner of your circumstances. But he says here, I'm not a prisoner of my circumstances. I'm a prisoner of the Lord. I can't get out of this, I can't change this. But I'm not blaming the Roman government. I'm saying the ultimate reason for where I am and what I'm doing is the Lord. And that gives a different perspective on everything you think about. I am in this job, maybe it's not easy, maybe the office environment isn't easy, maybe there's difficulties, maybe there's things I wish weren't there. But I'm, I'm here for the Lord. And you must imagine Paul in prison. There must have been guards who would have uh, mocked him, uh, hated him. You know, you read of Christians in prison and somebody brings them their food. Oh, and they slip and the food goes on the floor. Sorry, your food's on the floor. And now you have to eat it off the floor. You go hungry. I'm a prisoner of the Lord. And then he says, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. And this little word beseech is, you could say, I, I exhort you. You could say, I beg you. The word in the Greek language is the same word as the word paraclete. And the paraclete is the title for the Holy Spirit because he is the beseecher. When Paul says, I beseech you, it's not Paul, it's the Holy Spirit through Paul. This is God speaking to you. So God is saying, I 
the Holy Spirit beseech you. How could we translate the word beseech? Paraclete, we can translate him the encourager. The Holy Spirit comes alongside you to encourage you in Christian conduct. Encourage you to live the right way. And when we think of the work of the Holy Spirit, he comes alongside as your helper. That's another translation. Let me help you. He's the encourager, the helper. So he will see you doing a job and he'll say, let me encourage you in that job. You've got that, it's a hard job. I encourage you in it. And then he says, let me help you in it. You could translate it, I beg you. The Holy Spirit is not a beggar, but a father can beg his son. Don't do that. Do this. And in that light, the Holy Spirit does beg us. He's not a beggar, but he does, is able to humble himself because he's humble by very nature. And to come alongside you and beseech you. Do this. The Holy Spirit beseeching us to walk worthy of the calling with which we are called. We are called to live in Christ, to know his love, to know his power. All those things we were called to in chapters 1 to 3. To be part of this great mystery of God. To include us in his people. We are incredibly privileged. We are empowered. We are blessed. We are objects of his grace. Therefore, I want you, I'm begging you, says God, walk worthy of it. How? To walk worthy of this calling, we must walk in lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, Bearing one another, with one another in love. And the, the, of course the first word is humility, lowliness. And uh, all these things we've just, in that list, lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering and so on, bearing with one another, they are absolute essentials for the unity of the church. The unity of God's people. When you read the word lowliness and think of humility um, when you when you read of Jesus Christ when he washed their feet the introduction is not uh, that he was he started washing their feet the introduction is he knew that everything was given into his hands he knew that he was coming from God and going to God and with this exalted consciousness of his origins of his destiny of his his person with that exalted knowledge he then took off his clothes and put on the clothes of a slave so there is this wonderful combination of greatness of calling with humility humility i remember you know, probably quoted this to you before, Winston Churchill with his famous wit and sharp tongue, he said of Clement Attlee, he's a modest man, he's a humble man, and he's got a lot to be humble about. <laughs> and uh, that's, um, that's Winston Churchill's wit. And you think about my humility, I'm probably the humblest man who ever lived, um, but then you would say, yeah, but you've got a lot to be humble about. <laughs> Um, um, but Jesus Christ has nothing to be humble about. He has all power, all knowledge, love uh, uh, immeasurable. Jesus Christ is majestic. He's, he's magnificent. He's beautiful. He's, he's everything that is, is, is worthy of praise and honor and exaltation. That's why we worship him. He's not just got that job. You know, somebody's got the head of, head of, the, head of state. Oh, but they act, he's actually got all the qualities that make him the, the, the center of our love and our worship. And he is worthy to be exalted above every other name. And he's 
proven that by the love that took him to the cross. So he is worthy to be given a name above every other name. He is worthy to be exalted. But one of the great reasons why he is worthy to be exalted is because there is not the slightest thought or shred of pride in his heart or being. He, there is nothing arrogant. And uh, arrogance is a disqualification for, for holding any power or office whatsoever. When you think of that, it's the exact opposite of what's in the world. Jesus Christ, all lowliness, that's Jesus. Gentleness, that's Jesus. And gentleness is not a, a lack of power or strength. It's the correct use of strength. Um, if, he, if it was weakness, if gentleness meant, oh, he, he's weak. No, it's not weakness. It's the, the strongest power of all applied with such pre precision and that's gentleness <coughs> long suffering bearing with people and, and bearing with one another in love and you have this description of the basis of unity that, that we are to be humble to one another I think one of the greatest most miraculous effects of the Holy Spirit is to consider others better than yourself you know we we know that but i think we all have a sneaking suspicion that i am actually better than them we have that little it's a human kind of trigger it's a kind of default position i know better that's why People are so strong in their expression of their opinions. It's why people are so insulting to their, to their opposition. We know better. But when you, when you really embrace the fact that you are the least, then, then you change in your attitude to everybody. And you've heard me say this before, which is the least church. Um, uh, in Epsom, I would say it's Epsom Christian Fellowship, which is the least member of this church, is Les Wheels. And that is an accurate, that's, that's accurate. Now you would say, wait a minute, we, we are superior to, oh, what do you mean we're superior? Well, well, well we have doctrinal purity. Yes, but the Bible doesn't exalt the doctrinal purity. It's this love for the lost. Winning the lost. I think one of the greatest, um, greatest Christians in history, Hudson Taylor, motivated by this constant sense of, I must reach people. Who are dying without Christ. Now if that's our. If I would say that's, that was. That's the, the heart of the shepherd. It's the heart of God. If we measure ourselves by things like that. We might think. Oh maybe we are the least. The greatest church. Is one that is pouring itself out. To reach the lost. The least. The worst. The disqualified. If we, have, if we as a church believe that we could polish our doctrines and thereby be excellent, well, then I think we are, we are really on a dangerous track. It isn't just a, a pious position, oh, well, I'm the least. It's actually true. And it's something you embrace because once you do it, you can change. And you can be a blessing to people. But we always have this default position, oh well, I'm the least. Oh. That makes me secretly the best. It's like I often say I was the humblest man of the year and I was given a medal. But I was stripped of it for wearing it. <laughs> but there you go, <laughs> that's the point. The moment we begin to be conscious, self-consciously humble, 
and make that our, oh, I'm humbler than you. No, no, that's not the point. The point is, why are we the least? And the answer is, we must love the lost. And our doctrinal uh, purity is great, but it's not just for us, it's for a dying world. Doctrines are not just for us, they're for a dying world. The gospel. So, we, we must, we must and I put this in a, in a greater context because then it says, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And one of the things about unity is the absence of conflict. That's not unity. Unity is a positive thing. You know, if we were all sitting on a rowing boat and we were all sitting harmoniously talking but drifting, we were in the English Channel, where are we going to end up? Who cares? We're all happy here in our boat. We're not arguing and we've got flasks of tea and coffee and Vicky's made the flapjacks and, and Anne Bean's made the drizzle cake. We're a happy bunch of people. That's not unity. Unity is we're headed and we're going to pull together. We're going to exert our strength and our resources in one direction. And we're going to sit next to people as under rowers. You know, they're one of the titles of... of, of um, uh, leaders in the New Testament is, it's a Greek word that means under row. Uh, is, uh, I've forgotten where, it, where the exact quotation is. It's in Corinthians, but it's, we are under row. And the, the, in a big, big ship, a big Roman galley, you be placed next to somebody and you'll be chained there. And you might say, I don't like this person I'm next to. I don't like their sense of humour. And the answer of the Roman guard would be to take his cat of nine tails and <laughs> get back to your work. Now, of course, that's not the church. That's not the church. But the thing is, we are to work together in positive exer ex exertion of our strength, in praying for one another, in encouraging one another, and following the lead given to us by our godly leaders. So when our leaders call us to do something, we join wholeheartedly in that direction. That's keeping the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. It's, and you notice it's not creating the unity of the Spirit, it's keeping it. Because once we are in Christ, we have unity. We cannot make unity, but we have it. If we are truly born of the Holy Spirit, we are one with each other and we, are, we have this inner urge which we must obey to, to work together, to, to, to love and to follow in the same direction. This great exhortation to unity is because this is what glorifies the gospel and glorifies the work of Christ described in chapters 1 to 3. But also apply it in our relationship with other Christians. There are so many Christians in our nation, in different movements. And there may be some movements where you can say, that movement is not of God. There are such movements. And I would say there are some movements where I would say you cannot have fellowship with those people. And uh, that's, that's fairly... For example, I would say if somebody denied that Jesus Christ is, is God, I would say you cannot walk with them. If somebody denied the Trinity, I would... I would say you cannot walk with that person. You cannot walk with that movement. 
And there are other elements which I would say do make me have great concern about some movements. And we could talk about them. But there are others where the, the, the difference may be in style. And we have to be careful that we do not criticise other Christian movements. And rather encourage them. I've noticed as the pattern of things that there are places in the world where Christians are working together. This is particularly true of Singapore. They have this movement called Love Singapore. The Bible school I teach in, in Singapore, uh, we had 110 students there. Last term in March when I was there, there were 110 students. Can you imagine teaching 110 students a classroom, a big classroom? They were from approximately 40 different churches. 40 churches. Anglican, Methodist, Pentecostal. Nobody is asking which church do you come from in any critical way. And everybody is looking at the other churches with this warm glow. Thanking God for that church and that movement. Oh, but that church. They don't emphasize this like we do. There's none of that. It doesn't mean you close your eyes to an area where you are of concerns, but in your own heart you might say, I don't agree with that particular emphasis. But this warm glow of love and encouragement. And the result is, the churches in Singapore, and all those churches that work together, are growing. And, and there's such a move of the Holy Spirit in Singapore. Now, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons. And we are to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And when we find other Christians, I think, uh, in, look at the other churches that we know preach the gospel in this town. Encourage them. Love them. And it will be a blessing to them, but it will also be a blessing to your own soul. And he says there is one body, we've already mentioned this, there's only one church in Epsom, it's Epsom Christian Fellowship. <laughs> and one day they'll all come and see us. <laughs> no, 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 there's, there's one body, one church worldwide. Wherever you go in the world, you will find different expressions of the one church, but there's only one body. There's only one church. And, it, of course, it's emphasized by the fact there's only one Holy Spirit, one heaven we go to, one hope of our calling. The hope of our calling is that I will be changed. One month from now I will be different. One year from now I will be different. That's my hope. God is changing me. That's the hope of my calling. My hope is that I will be able to win people in my family, in my community, people I meet. That's the hope of my calling. There's a hope that I can reach people uh, for Christ and there's also a, a hope that I c they will one day be in heaven with, with Christ. This is the hope of our calling. So we have, there's only one hope of our calling. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And of course we've already mentioned this. There's one basis for our salvation, one death and resurrection, one place for us to come and lose our lives and find them again. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. You'll notice it says walk. And of course this is now actually putting one step in front of another. We have to work this out in actual life. Let me just mention one other thing. Ecumenicism, big word, if you've never heard that word, it means the work, working together of all the churches in the world. 
the ecumenical movement, in my opinion, is doomed to failure. Why? Because it is not built on Bible truth. It is built on unity for its own sake. And so if somebody said we are going to be part of the ecumenical movement, I would say, I'm sorry, no, I can't. I cannot work with the churches just to be one with them. I will work with churches on the basis of the unity of the, the faith, the scripture and so on, things we've already seen in the list. Ecumenicism is doomed to fail because it does not start with evangelical truth and so has no basis for unity. But shunning respect and love for other Christians who do have that unity and do have that love of the scripture, if we shun other Christians, it will lead to a withering of our soul and spiritual witness, weakness. So we walk in unity, and that's the first exhortation, and our time's gone, so we won't go to the next one. The next exhortation, let me just tell you where this chapter goes. This chapter next goes to a kind of exhortation to the use of spiritual gifts and how we function as a body. And we'll do that next time. So the first exhortation to walk in unity, the second exhortation from verse 7 to verse 16 is to exercise spiritual gifts and how they operate. And the last section of this uh, chapter is an exhortation to purity. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, you are Lord of your people. You love your church. You gave yourself for her. And every single member of your church the same. I praise you for your body in Epsom, this wonderful body of believers. And I pray, Lord, if our attitudes in any way are wrong, even slight changes that we may be positive and loving and keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of faith beyond even our local church. But help us, Lord, to love one another. And I pray, inspire us, lead us to pull together, to work together in prayer, in vision. We pray for our elders. Bless them and their families. Give them joy and courage as they go about your work. And give us the grace to love them and support them and encourage them. We pray let this church abound in positive unity. Not just the absence of any words, but the presence of good words that build up and prayers spoken to you that this body of believers, we Lord, we as an expression, may flourish and glorify you. This is our prayer in the light of your word and above all of your heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Les. Thank you all. Um, <clears throat> as I sort of hinted at, um, Les and I had a quick chat before the meeting. And one thing that came out of it was the, the strong, the leaders, the Leses, 
because they're so good. You know, he's so strong, he doesn't need prayer, etc. And anyway, Len and Vicky are rushing to America um, for family things um, after this meeting. And uh, it, it, it's very easy to think, well, you know, we don't need prayer. But I just thought, no, we'll actually pray for you at the end of this meeting because, because it's very easy not to. And we should do. So if anyone would like to just, just join in and pray for Les and Vicky, I'll start and then anyone else can, can do it. Father, we do thank you that each of us are precious in your sight. Each of us, Lord, are, are brothers and sisters to one another. Lord, and we want to support one another and lift each of us up to you. Lord, it's easy to think that, that those who, who seem to be able to walk straight and strong, Lord, almost don't need support, but they do. Lord, and often the, the trials and tribulations that I'm sure Les goes through are very different to the ones I go through. But they are, they are relevant to who he is and what's going on in his and Vicky's lives. And we just know that he needs your support every day. So we just lift them up to you, Lord, and ask that you would just go with them as they go to America, as they fly, as they meet family, as they deal with all the things going on, that you would just give them grace and wisdom and a lot of love and a huge amount of fun.